<clears throat> Hello, um, uh, today is um, May 10th, 2023, and we'll talk about two architects, both born on May 10th. We'll start with Antonin Raymond, who was born in 1887, one year younger than uh, Le Corbusier, and died in 1976. Let's uh, read a little bit about him. Before, uh, but before, let's uh, see some pictures with him. I mentioned earlier that he is an, uh, an archi He was an architect, very appreciated by Kenneth Frampton. Um, and here he is with uh, with his wife and with an interesting uh, uh, belt for his pants. Rather romantic and unusual. I like them here. So, Antonin Raymond, he was Czech. Uh, Czech Antonin Raymond, uh, born as Anton Antonin Raymond, born on the 10th of May 19, 1888, the Kingdom of Bohemia, uh, and died in uh, November 1976 in Pennsylvania. The United States was a Czech, um, Czech American architect. Raymond was born and studied in Bohemia, now part of the Czech Republic, working later in the United States and Japan. Raymond was also the consul of Czechoslovakia to Japan from 1926 to 1939. Incredible. So in 1926, he was uh, 38 years old. And until 1939, so he for uh, 13 years, he was the consul of Czechoslovakia to Japan. Very unusual, no, for an architect. It, well, very unusual for many people, but I don't know of any other architect to be, you know, to have a political, uh, um, you know, position uh, of this um, uh, amplitude for so many years. 13 years. In, in, in which year, meaning 1939, the Czech diplomacy was closed down after the occupation of the European country by Nazi Germany. Uh, his uh, initial work with American architects Cass Gilbert and Frank Lloyd White gave him all insight into the use of concrete for texture and structure that he would refine throughout his six decade career. Now we know that concrete pollutes a lot, but at, at his time, during his time, this was not an issue. At studio practices in New Hope, Pennsylvania and Tokyo, he explored traditional Japanese building techniques combined with the latest in American building innovations. Raymond applied these principles to a wide range of residential, commercial, religious and institutional projects in Japan, America, India, and the Philippines, along with British architect Josias Conder. Uh, I don't know of him, but uh, I don't know of many things. Uh, Raymond is recognized as one of the fathers of modern architecture in Japan. Now look at that. So an architect born in Czechoslovakia uh, and living in, later in Japan and, uh, and uh, the United States, he's considered one of the fathers of modern architecture in Japan. Please do not forget this, Antonin Raymond. Ignored by Henry Russell Hitchcock Jr. and Philip Johnson in their curatorial celebration of the international style in 1932, this is what Kenneth Frampton wrote, and despite the homecoming exhibition of his work staged in the Rockefeller Center in 1939 and the AIA uh, New York chapter Medal of Honor that was awarded to him 17 years later in 1956, the AIA is the American Institute of Architects, one has the feeling that Raymond's achievements were always somehow grudgingly received by his compatriots. And even now, over 50 years later, there remains a silent consensus in the field that is reluctant to acknowledge the unrivaled excellence and breathtaking scope of Raymond's architectural career. So from the eminent critical theoretician, very uplifting words towards Raymond, Anthony Raymond. 
So let's look at some of his works. Tokyo Women's Christian College in Tokyo, 1921-1938. Uh, we we'll look at the chapel auditorium from 1934. And uh, indeed, it's, it's a very fine work. <clears throat> there are some influences here from Perret, Auguste Perret, <clears throat> but uh, what do we see here? We see concrete, a vigorous structure, but we also see the sensitivity of the treatment of the windows. So the windows become ornamental. And uh, while they do, do not have a narrative, uh, you know, the kind of uh, stained glass windows in the Gothic cathedrals had, they still evoke uh, a, a different kind of um, glass work that uh, compared to what we are accustomed to today. So I like the, 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 the relationship between the, the vigor of the concrete structural work and the sensitivity of the large um, glass work, meaning uh, you know, the large uh, windows of this chapel. Uh, he also employed color and is not bad. So you see, you can do a lot with glass if you escape the temptation to use just a one single piece of glass without any character, you know, in the name of allowing to, as much light as possible and as much space as possible into your eye or into your uh, inner, inner space. But I think um, the light and space are also uh, they are not just uh, uh, you know uh, determined by quantitative uh, attributes but also qualitative so you know a large space is not necessarily a good space whatever Jean Nouvel said he said uh, a nice apartment is a large apartment well I had seen large apartments which were not so nice and I had seen small apartments which are nice so again you know, ju just the simple fact that the space is big or huge doesn't guarantee, you know, uh, uh, a very architectural, uh, uh, I mean, a, a, you know, a positive or qualitative uh, space. And it's the same with light. You can be flooded with light, but if that light is not filtered in a certain way, it's not, um, you know, uh, nuanced, well, it could be even bothering. So not everything that is big is good. Sometimes what is small is good. And, uh, you know, those um, uh, windows that uh, Antonin Raymond did for this uh, chapel in Tokyo, I think uh, could make us think about what a window is. Because you see, it's, 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 it's a window that, uh, that uh, filters light and uh, uh, is uh, is an almost an impressionistic window because of its fragmentation. It's almost embroidered, almost. Uh, this part, there are some influences you can see from Frank Lloyd Wright. He's not as free as Frank Lloyd Wright, a little bit stiff, but maybe exactly because of it, uh, somehow interesting. Is he breathtaking, as Kenneth Frampton said? I don't know. <laughs> I, I wouldn't really consider his work breathtaking, but, but it's uh, worthy of our attention. A house in Tokyo, 1924. Now this one is interesting and unexpected in its asymmetry uh, and uh, almost radical in its austerity and asymmetry. Antonin Raymond. The architect was ignored by Hitchcock and uh, not the film director, but the, the art uh, historian and critic and Philip Johnson. When they created that uh, famous international style exhibition and they totally ignored uh, uh, Antonin Raymond. Here is the plan of the house. Rather unusual, those curved uh, corners or the, you know, the major 
well, is the, the, only the left lower corner, but well, not only because you see on the right side also there is an entrance with the uh, rounded uh, corners. Uh, the corner is always a problem in architecture. It's besides the, um, I mean, in many ways, an architecture defines itself through how you solve the problem of the corner because the corner is it's not just the, the place where two worlds meet, as the, the important uh, North American writer Salinger said in one of his writings, and he received the Nobel Prize for Literature. And in one of his uh, writings, I forgot which one, not that I read a lot, but that one I read, uh, he said, um, uh, <clears throat> do you know what a, a wall says to another wall? And the answer was, meet you at the corner. So indeed the corner is that place where a, a wall meets another wall and it's, it's the most um, problematic part of the building because it's also the most vulnerable to the elements. Time itself hits the most in the corner, you know, and uh, it's also the, on one hand, it's the most assertive, the corner, because it's, it's a sumum there of two walls uh, and at the same time, it's the most vulnerable, it's the most fragile. Maybe that's why Louis Sullivan uh, emphasized the corner with his phantasmagoric ornamentation. But here with Antonin Raymond, we see the curving of the corner to make it maybe less assertive, more gentle. Anyway, this house deserves some attention. And... Uh, as I said, uh, you know, he, uh, well, I said, it wasn't me who said it. We read what Prenton said, that this man actually was able to bring together various influences. And uh, here is the power of his architecture, but also its weakness. Because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a hybrid architecture. Which and hybridity is not a bad thing, actually. It depends. It depends. Frank Lloyd Wright probably would have dismissed this idea that uh, hybridity is uh, is a good thing because hybridity is close to conglomeration. And in the case of concrete, Frank Lloyd Wright, for example, didn't like concrete because he he named it a conglomerate. Uh, he wanted something more pure and more organic, not, uh, you know, a, 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 almost an artificial adding of various parts. Hoshi University main building in Tokyo, 1924. Again, an architecture of convention almost, not, not radical, not very, not extravagant. Although he did some interesting things, we are going to see them. Erishman residence in Yokohama again. Uh, now, how he received these commissions in Japan, I guess through his diplomatic activity, activities, because he was a consul of Czechoslovakia in, in Japan, and uh, he had relations with uh, diplomatic relations with uh, other diplomats. And uh, that's how they see, he received commissions, being an architect. I don't know. I mean, you know, this kind of building uh, doesn't make us, uh, you know, say, wow. But maybe there is a quality exactly in this that is not a radical architecture. It's still, uh, maybe it's a Japanese-ness derives exactly from this. Although we know that Japan was... Uh, uh, was and is uh, a field of uh, experimental architecture, of, uh, a lot of audacity. Uh, we don't see a lot of audacity here unless we consider the import of uh, European or North, North American models into Japan. Japan did this. Often it was influenced by, uh, uh, you know, what happened outside of it. That is after 1850 when the country opened up to the world. Before that uh, was uh, in good measure uh, almost a feudal island cut off from, from the rest of the world in its uh, exceptionalism. 
Now, uh, these shutters of the windows, you know, you, you wouldn't really expect them like this and colored like this in Japan. Anyway, uh, who knows, the diplomat was probably not Japanese. So, you know, the, the building uh, tried to respond to some requirements coming from a different culture, perhaps, although the building was built in, in Japan. Antonin Remo, great trees, great trees. Uh, here is an exhibition that took place in this house. Uh, it was not done by Antonin Raymond, but I thought of including it in the presentation because it shows um, a very refined uh, a taste that the Japanese have for, uh, you know, subtle things, for um, discreteness, for, uh, um, I mean, it, 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 it's a lesson in, uh, um, in uh, l'esprit de finesse. It's an art, I don't know, a, a, a landscape architect or an artist. No, I think an artist, this, this show, uh, I hope I have, let's see, just a second. Yes, I mean, here I have some images of this show. I, I, I spent some time to add some more images, but let's read a little bit about it because I think it's important. The, the exhibition in, inside the, Erishman, Erishman House in Yokohama, which was built by uh, Antonin Raymond, this white forest exhibition was by Mono, uh, I guess an artist or a, a cooperative of artists, Japanese. Mono designed the artwork White Forest, which was exhibited in Erishman's house, one of old Western style houses authorized as a historical architectures by Yokohama city government as a formal program of the festival harmony of flower and table in Yamate of Yokohama city, Japan. So <clears throat> to try under the theme of fresh flower design and table decoration, we had a special guest, Miss Madoka Shimasu, flower and table decoration coordinator and created the artwork with her in collaboration. The title is White Forest. I guess that's what the, the mono wrote. <clears throat> with a fictional story that a lot of trees surrounding Arisman House in the park extend into this interior space, we set two kinds of flowers. One was paper art as analogy for memories of, of this 80s house and another was living plants as for people's lives in the present. This artwork was perfectly a new exhibition for lifestyle with a collaboration of space art, flesh, fresh, I guess it's written wrongly, fresh flower and table decoration. And, you know, I, I, I admire this kind of work because it's, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's very subtle, it's discreet, it, it's, it's, it's about flowers, but it's also about decoration, about ornamentation, and it's about uh, uh, the fragility of existence and the beauty of nature. And I think these things need to be uh, continuously uh, remembered. Otherwise, we just build structures, 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 and we forget the other side of of uh, not just architecture, but life itself. A very fine work, you know, done with the uh, green uh, plants, uh, flowers, fresh flowers, but there are also artificial flowers here from what we read and the look at the treatment of the windows, an installation by some artists. Ornament, almost like in a uh, Herzog and the Moron building. Can you imagine the minuteness the required to do something like this? Ephemeral art, but it's carpe diem. You know, you, you live in the present, you live in the moment and you try to do a thing as well as possible. A sensitive thing, Japan in the house built by Antonin Raymond, one of the fathers of modern architecture in Japan, a foreigner, a consul. 
from Czechoslovakia. Again, he didn't do this work. Mono did. There's uh, artists in uh, from Japan. The Italian embassy villa in Nico, 1929. We remember that Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier was built in 1928, so this was one year later. Let's look at the Italian embassy villa. Not bad. I actually, I like this building. I like its uh, uh, lack of uh, ostentation and also its echoes of the traditional art of building in Japan, but it's not just Japanese, and yet it is Japanese. It's a very fine work, I think. It's called the Villa for the Italian Embassy. But I feel tempted to study this work carefully because I think Antonin Raymond here does show his skill to, to combine, to unite what we call the past with what we call the present. It's fascinating in a way you now that, that a foreigner coming from Czechoslovakia, who was a consul, here he was, you know, arriving at the status of being uh, one of the fathers of modern architecture in Japan. I like very much this uh, veranda. You know, it's a linear, long, uh, it's kind of almost like a second living room, very long, you know, approximately, approximately narrow. And then the window also, the way it was done, divided into those small squares. I think this space would have been very, you know, uh, pleasant. And I think this, something like this can be done very easily, for example, in... Uh, in other parts of the world, including our country. And yet, there is modernity here. It's not just tradition, it's not just turning one's head towards the past, but there is also modernity, yes. This is one of his best buildings, in my opinion, Antonin Raymond. Uh, we see here a website, uh, you know, a nearly, a nearly sense, synthesis of East-West design, Anthony Raymond. It sounds strange, a nearly synthesis. Well, almost, almost a synthesis of East and West design by this Czech architect, Anthony Raymond. British Embassy Memorial Villa. Similar almost almost too much similar um, to the to the villa for the Italian uh, embassy now this is for the British embassy and yes these these two buildings I think are almost mysterious in their simplicity I myself should uh, be more silent and uh, investigate the buildings more because they they attract me Yes, this uh, blending, this mixture of East and West uh, is, uh, is, is uh, clearly the sign of, uh, you know, of a significant talent. And maybe we need such infusions of the other in our own work. Another villa, Nico, 1931. Not always I found the best uh, pictures. But uh, I think I have here also in this presentation his own house. Uh, Tokyo Golf Club in Osaka, 1932. Well, architects cannot avoid for too long working for the rich. And the rich like to play golf. What can we do about it? Including President, uh, ex-President Donald Trump and including Konstantin Brunkush. 
who spent his last years of his life rather often uh, on the golf uh, course. And uh, he, in his atelier in Paris, uh, you know, the building built by Renzo Piano in front of Centre Georges Pompidou, there are the tools of playing golf right there. I don't know how they are called, but um, yes, Brinkush loved golf. But all I, I thought about it, and uh, forgive my, uh, you know, sincerity, uh, which is maybe not very diplomatic, but sincerity very often is not quite diplomatic or well chosen. But I thought of it, you know, many sports are very erotical in nature. You know, I mean, most of them are about throwing a ball into a hole, you know, into <laughs> H-O-L-E. You know, uh, handball, uh, football, uh, golf. You know, it's all about uh, it's all about uh, hitting. Uh, you know, uh, arriving at a hole, and uh, I don't know. It's something a little bit uh, so explicit and uh, also so strange that. Anyway, I, I think half of the sports in the world are like this. Maybe it's a deviant uh, sexuality. Maybe this could be uh, the definition of sport, uh, deviant or oblique, oblique sexuality. Uh, or, or I see things completely wrongly. That is also possible. I mean, why the fascination to throw uh, or to hit a ball from far away to enter a little hole, you know, in the ground, <laughs> which is uh, beyond the hill or something like this? What is the fascination in football to, I mean, did you see the joy of the football players after they, 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 uh, they uh, create a, a goal, you know, uh, they, they, they hit the, the net of the, of the gate, or I don't know how they are called actually in English, but you understand. It's like they, they, they reached uh, God himself, that they, the joy is immense, and I wonder why. In essence, it's not something so, I mean, you could look at it with cold, uh, with cold blood, but that's not what happens. And those who hit the hole, uh, you know, they, they are considered heroes and, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, celebrate that the little ball entered the hole. About, enough about the golf. Summer house, another, uh, this one I think is uh, for him, yes. So 1933, Antonin Raymond built this summer house in Karuizawa. I don't know if I pronounce well. And it's an interesting house. I hope I have other pictures. Yeah. It's really a fine house, uh, an interesting house. Um, no, no, this architect was quite something. And can you imagine he did all of this while he was also a consul in the embassy? In black and white is also good, the work. And yes, maybe you would agree with Kenneth Frampton that it is breathtaking, you know, uh, because, you know, even the employment of the trunk of a tree without uh, disciplining it into becoming a round, perfect, uh, perfectly vertical column in itself could be considered, you know, rather unconventional and breathtaking. Uh, not to speak about the covering of, with plants of uh, those uh, top parts of the building. So you could say this is a very ecological building, no? A very sustainable building. It is a building, it is the work of man, but it's, uh, it's not aggressively distancing itself from nature. It is, I'm beginning to agree with Kenneth Frampton on this. His own house. Summer House, Karuizawa, 1933. 
He was still a consul at that time. I also like uh, these um, these um, coverings of the windows towards the outside. You know, very gentle, very flexible, very uh, you know uh, organic and modest and uh, efficient at the same time. I need something like this myself. I should remember. I need for some windows which are too close to the street to cover them like this. Not bad. Antonin Raymond, Summer House, 1933. And look at the foundations or the, you know, the, the pedestal. I don't know if I can call it pedestal or on which the house rests. You know, it's with the simplest means and it works. It's elevated a little bit from the earth. The only, you know, uh, strange thing that I find if I'm allowed to call it so is this, this corner here. <laughs> You know, I, I consider it a, a skillfulness, you know, that, uh, but maybe I'm, I'm too conventional, you know, that this horizontal meets the, the, the diagonal at this, uh, you know, angle here. And I wonder why, but I guess we didn't mind it. I don't know. I, I find this something that would uh, almost unavoidably uh, make the professor you know, a little anxious, maybe. Otherwise, it's a very fine building. A great living room. He was doing well, Antonin Raymond. And we see there the, you know, the typical architects uh, supporting legs for the for the drafting board. Uh, when you see something like this you are in the close proximity of design and architecture, almost unavoidably. Another house, 1933 in Tokyo, but no, uh, no pictures. Uh, this one is also in Tokyo. I like his house more than, than this. Uh, now in 1939, the Raymond Farm in New Hope. So we are away from Japan. And uh, I guess this is in Pennsylvania. Something happened to him. I, I think I think what he did in Japan was superior to to what we see here. Maybe here he had, he just uh, um, you know refurbished an existing building. It's possible, a farm, and now is a uh, I don't know workshops take place there, uh, architects, students, is some kind of a foundation that, that, he, uh, that he founded like, because he died. This is the building. Now, of course, this is not a building designed by Raymond, uh, Antonin Raymond. So yeah, it was an existing building that he, uh, you know, uh, utilized, used for, for, for this foundation and for his own uh, activities. St. Joseph the Worker Church, Victoria City, Negros, the Filipinas, 1949. I know he, he left to the United States because of the Second World War. I don't know exactly when he left, during the war or immediately after the war, and then he returned to Japan. 
he he probably loved Japan and uh, he lived for more years in Japan. Uh, this is in Filipinas, a church. We see here again the decorative, the ornamental panel that filters the light. And even here we see kind of a porous wall. It's an interesting building. And I like even the naive, uh, you know, uh, narrative done by a painter on this facade of the building. It's okay. And, um, you know, narration, pictorial narration takes place inside as well. Okay, and now uh, Raymond House and Studio Azabu, 1951, back in Japan, in 1951, he built a smaller house for himself, uh, Studio House and Studio, 1951, Antonin Raymond. And now this picture I saw, uh, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's the same building, no. I think it's a different building, but this picture, belongs to the previous house that he built for himself, that summer house. Sorry about the presence of this picture here. Reader's Digest offices in Tokyo, 1951. So, you know, the American presence in Japan after 1945 was heavily felt. So Re Reader's Digest built offices in Tokyo, not much later after the war ended. And here it is, and I, I like this building too, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's in Japan, it's built by a Czech American architect, but, uh, and the building is for uh, an American publication, Reader's Digest, but the, the, the building has a Japanese uh, uh, personality, I would say, and I like that it is not assuming, it's not, it's not, it's not very assertive. It's not a typical office building. Read, Reader's Digest building in Tokyo, 1955. A not particularly strikely, striking image of the building designed by Anthony Raymond, who had had an architectural practice in Japan before the Pacific War. But the building under construction from 1949 to 1951 was transforming on multiple levels. While Raymond used the latest concrete construction techniques available at the time, he also sought to blend traditional Japanese and modern Western architecture to follow, I quote, the Japanese respect for proper, proper orientation, closeness to nature, and use of material in the natural state, including sculpting the landscape into bulbous mounds with a stream and a reservoir added for natural air conditioning. Nice. Natural air conditioning. Perhaps we should think about this. Cunningham House, Tokyo, 1954. A little different, these houses, from what he built before the war. Let's remember, Antonin Raymond is considered one of the fathers of modern architecture in Japan, although he was not Japanese. Saint, Saint Anselm's Church in Tokyo, 1954. It's quite a church. I mean, in terms of dimensions. But we see again his uh, artistry in uh, filtering light uh, in, in more uh, complex and subtle ways. Otherwise, exposed concrete. I understood that Japan, in its efforts for reconstruction, became one of the, uh, the most uh, 
uh, you know, they use the most concrete in their construction. And, 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 and indeed, many buildings in Japan are built with concrete. And we know the Polish concrete of Tadawando, but many modern architects employed concrete a lot in Japan. And here is Antonin Raymond also employing uh, um, exposed concrete. But it's a fine building and with a fine abstract or modern, you know, decorative art. Again, we see the fact that he was reluctant to leave a large piece of glass all by itself. So he brought ornament to the glass. And that's what we look at here. In our time, probably most architects would have uh, employed a very large piece of glass and that's it. But that was not his sensibility. Good for him. And yes, stained glass window. It's a church after all. Abstract as it is. Uh, you know, designed uh, hand, uh, you know, uh, handle for the door. I like the fact that uh, in Japan, but not only in Japan, you know, modern architecture brought to sacred architecture the raw concrete, the exposed concrete, and the uh, in many instances, uh, the, you know, the clients, so to speak, didn't protest. And I think uh, it's correct not protesting because religion, you know, like any spiritual work, needs some, uh, some austerity, you know, to soften and embellish excessively and make it sweet, in my opinion, is not quite appropriate for the stringencies of spiritual work. It's a good building, this one by Anthony Draymond, yes. And we have the wood of the benches and the concrete of the structure of the building. And then we have other, we have innovations here. Look at this stair. And that little window has the sign of the cross in it. Even the handrail is interesting. And it's just a so-called detail. Not bad. Antonin Raymond, one of the fathers of modern architecture in Japan. Iowa River State Park in Rockingham County. This is in the United States, but uh, you know, I don't know. The building is so is a fundamentalist building. It's a is a raw, uh, primal, um, elemental architecture that that I like very much. It's not a very big building, but it's monumental because of of, of how it is crystallized as an architectonic so-called solution. Interesting architect, no doubt.
Even his name is interesting, you know, because you think with his name, Antonin Raymond, it sounds almost French, but he was Czech. Well, even a good building comes to an end. And that's it about him today. So let's let's talk a little bit about him because I think it's important to 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 talk a little bit about Antonin Raymond. Uh, 